related to international experience, which is relevant to the topic of the conference, which is building connections within the um, artistic and cultural societies in Ukraine, but also abroad. And uh, we are sure, and we also could see that the from the previous three presentations that this experience is very relevant to what we are experiencing right now. And uh, I would like to pass the mic to the first presenter, who is Karen Yagodin from the Obama Museum of Occupations and Freedom um, in Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, Karen is here with us online. And uh, Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all online and uh, as said, I will be presenting the experience of, uh, of Babamu. Um, I will just shortly start sharing my screen uh, so that you can also follow what I'm about to talk to you. So uh, um, I'm the executive director of the museum and, um, and we have um, a rather good global Estonian network with whom we are working or have been trying to work at least. So I will be just sharing the experience that I have from, from our institution and a bit of the feedback that I also gathered from other um, colleagues from the museum field, uh, how they, uh, from their institutional perspective, try to stay connected with, uh, with global Estonians. Um, but to begin with, uh, just very shortly also about our museum. Uh, Vabamu is the largest active non-profit museum in Estonia. So we are a uh, private museum, which makes us a bit different in the museum field of Estonia. Our mission is to educate the people of Estonia and its visitors. Um, okay, they are, I don't know why they are changing themselves, okay. Um, and all our um, mission is based on the sense of um, freedom. So how to advocate for freedom, for justice, for the rule of law, how to make people understand their responsibility on keeping freedom. And a very po big part of our mission is uh, grounded to the founder of the museum, uh, Olga Gistler Rizzo, who was an Estonian American refugee. And the museum was then um, uh, founded in partnership with the Estonian government. And uh, already at the opening, al although the first title of the museum was called the Museum of Occupations, uh, the president, Leonard Meri, declared Vabamo to be the freedom's house. So our concept, although we are talking about uh, difficult past and difficult destinies and choices that the people have had in Estonia, uh, we are always talking about that through the perspective of, uh, of freedom. So, um, Olga Kistler Rizzo, the founder of the museum, as said on the previous slide, was an Estonian American war refugee. She was actually born in 1920 in Kiev, in Ukraine. Um, her father was Estonian, her mother was Polish origin. And um, in 1920s, when she was just a few years old, her family uh, decided to move back to Estonia from Kiev. And uh, on their way back to Estonia through Russia uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution and, and events, um, her father was imprisoned uh, and sent to the Gulag prison camp and, uh, and died there. And her mother um, was caught fatally ill and passed away as well. So as just a few years old, a uh, little girl, uh, she was suddenly orphanaged uh, together with um, her brother, uh, the family members managed to get them to Estonia. They were brought up here by relatives and, um, and other family friends. And by 1944, uh, during the Second World War, uh, by, uh, by spring 1944, uh, she graduated the University of Tartu in Estonia as, um, as a doctor, as a, um, um, as a medical doctor. And in September 1944, just before the Soviet army occupied Estonia. Uh, she was one of the 80,000 Estonian citizens who fled Estonia during the Second World War. So she ended up being for years in the German uh, refugee camps. And by the end of 1940s, uh, she managed to get on to the United States of America. And she lived um, the rest of her life and had a very good career as a medical doctor there in the US. 
So uh, why this context is important is that she is a war refugee. She has personally lived through what it means to leave your homeland. And she has a very strong mission to give back to Estonia. So um, in 1991, when Estonia became independent again, uh, she decided to think about what is what she can do for Estonia. And in 1998, she founded the Kistleritsa Foundation. And as a result, in 2003, the Museum of Occupations was um, opened in Tallinn. So I hope some of you have visited us. If not, you're all very welcome to, to come and visit us in Tallinn. Uh, we have the first building in Estonia that it's purposefully been built um, as a museum. And um, recently, just in 2018, the new permanent exhibition was, uh, was opened. Mm, and um, together with the new permanent exhibition, also the new name, Vabamo, the Museum of Occupations and Freedom, was introduced. So what this leaves us with is that we have a very strong culture uh, of experiencing giving back mentality. So when you have been doing well, when you are privileged in your life and you have um, had the chance to, to leave the country, to, uh, to survive the war and have a new life and career somewhere abroad, you start to think, what is it that I can give back to my homeland? Um, as she fled to US, uh, her family um, has a very, uh, through the museum, has very strong connections and ties with North, North American Estonian expat communities. So not only in the US, but also in Canada. And we have also a new wave of uh, global Estonians and friends of Estonia who have uh, um, either become friends of Estonia within the last 15 or 20 years or Estonians who have left Estonia within the last 10, 15 years. So they are not war refugees, but they have they are people who have left Estonia because of um, um, education, job careers, choices in private life. They have found a decision. They have made a decision in their life why they want to live somewhere else. But they are very much connected to Estonia. And we uh, like to call them as the global Estonians because they also share the mentality of being connected to Estonia and trying to give somehow back something to, to Estonian society and to Estonian cultural field. Um, to try, uh, as I was trying to think about a framework, how to explain the way we operate with uh, expat communities or global Estonians. I think the best framework to, to describe it is through time, talent and treasure. Um, these are the ways people have stayed connected with us and these are the way we uh, like uh, group them on, um, on based on how they, um, how they stay connected with us. So time. First resource is time. You can think about ways how you can engage with people so that they put time into your organization. So one of the ways we have experienced it that uh, while we have having while we have been having uh, different collecting campaigns, for example, eight millimeter of life or different stories, um, letters, correspondences, um, um, artifacts, historical artifacts about uh, expat communities and their destinies is that the people who live among those foreign communities can be the people who put their time into finding these stories, finding these films or photographs or, or letters and correspondences and can work for us based on the time they put into this project. Um, one other way how we stay connected with these people based on time, resources, working in advisory boards. So we have a tradition on different uh, branches of activities that we have in our museum to form also advisory boards or supervisory councils and uh, putting just quarterly a few hours into the organization through those networks and um, ideas that you share in the advisory boards can be very valuable. Um, usually people who build their new life in a new country, become um, very good at networking uh, among local um, communities. So they can be your resources on doing networking on those, on those um, areas and on those um, um, uh, regions. And uh, finally, they basically start to work for you as your institution's ambassadors. So they are your ambassadors abroad on um, in different countries or in, in different communities, and they can put 
if they decide and if you if you come to this agreement to really be your networking advisory and um and idea sharing uh, resources based on the time they put into your organization mm, the second was uh, keyword talent so this is very much around the professional um, qualifications and the expertise that the people have so they are usually curators translators editors people who can work abroad live abroad but stay connected based on their professional career and professional knowledge with their institution and i think this is the main way how estonian museums stay connected with experts that have uh, uh, moved abroad that uh, they still work for their museum as um, as a curator as a translator editor so something that is connected to the content they can very easily be also project manager for example we in Wabamu have very good experiences how um, estonians who live abroad become project managers for traveling exhibitions and programs for us there abroad so you really need to work closely together with the locations and the people you want to engage with and they can do it much better there than we here from Estonia. And, um, and also for the community and expat events, like for example in Estonia we have very popular ESTO days. So these are for the Estonian communities and the expats who want to come and have their event in Estonia every second year, every third year. So this is the way how we can bridge and bring them together and those people together uh, through also these experts that, uh, that live abroad. And the third keyword was about treasure. So one of the main ways of uh, valuing treasure is through giving back. So for example, if you have already lived uh, long enough abroad and uh, you have been privileged to, to build some kind of uh, capital, uh, there might be this uh, mentality of, of giving back to your homeland. And it can be also about finances and money and putting this back to the society. But it doesn't necessarily have to be about the treasure that the person privately has. Um, it can be also through fundraising campaigns and networks. So, for example, when uh, Wabamu opened um, in 2018 the new permanent exhibition, then a big fundraising campaign was done in the US. And uh, we from Estonia would have never known exactly the way the fundraising works in the US. So we did th this through the key people the key Estonian people who are living in the US, who have the networks, who have the connections, who know how to stay connected, who know what kind of messages to use. And um, it was really important that um, that we have these people there who can help us with, uh, with fundraising campaigns. And right now we are really developing our Global Conversations Activity Branch, which is one of the third activity pillars of our museums that is dedicated to international events and connections. And a lot of the global activities, uh, the funds for the, that activity branch is also fundraised abroad. So again, we are trying to use the same scheme that um, for fundraising abroad, we need to have people working there, living there, knowing the context, knowing the conditions. But if they are Estonians, then they also understand our ways of working and we can really bridge those knowledges um, together. So uh, time, talent, treasure, this is basically how we do it. We, we think about who are the people who can give their time to us, who are the people who can give their knowledge, uh, their talent uh, and, and stay connected with our institution to that aspect. And then the treasure, uh, the way how we can uh, collaborate on, um, on funds and fundraising and, and uh, different grants and, and uh, projects like that. So, um, when I try to think about some prerequisites and conclusions, what we have learned, it's really crucial, it's really important that you have this transparency and trust in your organization, that people really want to work with you and want to stay connected. So they have the leadership and team, they, they are certain of, of the leadership team and the team execution, that the ideas that they are putting the time and talent that they are putting into our organization really pays off and, and is being executed. It really needs flexibility on time schedules, even on work hours and time because of time zones. So as we work a lot with US and Canada, we are all the time 
uh, facing the question of different time zones and when we can meet people online, what are the, what are the different traditions of, of uh, working? Uh, I guess in general Estonia has, it has become really flexible on working hours and uh, distance uh, working uh, already before COVID times, but especially the COVID times show that we we really have all the digital um, means uh, to work uh, from different locations. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be everybody in one one office. I think it's culturally different. Um, it depends how your culture works on this sense and how your organization supports flexibility. But I think with uh, working with people living abroad, it's really important to be flexible. Mm, it's always better to start with existing connections and then build new ones atop. So I think our first existing connection was the founder's family. Mm, Olga Gistlerizzo herself has passed away, but uh, her daughter is right now the head of the supervisory council. Her whole family is very much connected still to Estonia and to the mission of Babamo. And uh, the first network very much was built based on their personal connections. So you start from something that you have and then you build up uh, on, on from there. And uh, then just be clear on what do you need as an institution? What do you need from these people? Is it the time? Is it the talent or the treasure? So this is maybe one set of tools that will help you um, help you prioritize or just uh, see the way of uh, of being connected with your global communities or or it's just sharing this way how we we have been doing this so far so um, i hope this uh, gave you some kind of an idea what we do here in wapamu and and how we try to work with our global communities okay Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for um, for this very meaningful uh, and full of insights uh, presentation. We'll be waiting for you to join our question and answer session because I'm sure we'll have some questions for you. And, uh, and now I would like to pass the mic to Yeva Astachowska from Latvian Center for Contemporary Art in Riga, Latvia. Uh, Yeva, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, do you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm glad to join you uh, in this hybrid form, uh, being still in Riga. And um, I don't know, maybe uh, as, as I, w I didn't manage how to share my presentation myself, uh, I'll need some help. Maybe you can put the first slide uh, on the screen. The slide is on the screen, so you can proceed. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I I gave the title of my presentation issue of migration, uh, cultural workers, institutional pers pers perspective from Latvia, uh, and in that sense, my mm, narrative of my presentation will be a bit broader than um, than uh, the previous one, uh, which was discussing a concrete experience um, <clears throat> of a museum in Estonia. Even though so I'm um, here probably representing also uh, my institution, which is Latvian Center for Contemporary Art. I'm working as a curator and a researcher, dealing a lot with um, socialist and post-socialist uh, context, um, entanglement of post-socialist and post-colonial perspectives in Baltic countries and in Eastern Europe. Uh, but here, maybe I'll talk I'll more about um, institutional contact than uh, content uh, directly. Um, so concerning the issue of migration of cultural workers uh, coming from Latvia, uh, of course the context I can share here is uh, on the one hand uh, very different from Ukraine, which is in the focus of this assembly and which uh, is already the past months in, in this violent uh, war. Yet, on the other hand, I see also similarity between our countries, and uh, a lot of these aspects were discussed already in previous sessions as well. I managed to, to listen. Um, still, uh, I can only talk about peacetime migration, and today, of course, the uh, situation is very different from 
1940s when also Latvia escaped uh, Latvia uh, faced war and uh, when escaping the Soviet regime from Latvia about 10% of the population emigrated to the West and uh, also stayed there and among them very many intellectuals including artists art and counting, counting together both immigrated and deported people to Siberia uh, during World War II uh, Latvia lost almost one third of its population. And um, here, you, maybe you could uh, show the second slide. So, talking about the intellectuals and artists who immigrated to the West, <clears throat> escaping the Soviet regime, at that time only a few of them were able to continue working in their profession, namely as artists or cultural workers. And even those who did were mostly active in local exile communities. <clears throat> but often also cultivating very nostalgic memories of their lost homeland that had little to do with the actual reality and also uh, with, with the uh, actual art scene in the countries they live. Uh, and what you can see on the screens is uh, some slides from the project my colleagues at the Latin Center for Contemporary Arts have uh, developed. Namely, they were researched in the context um, about Latvian exile and immigrant contemporary art. This was exhibition series titled Portable Landscapes. Uh, the project aimed to state uh, to situate Latvian emigre uh, and uh, exile artists um, in the broader context of the histories of art, migration, and civilization. And what uh, the project did, uh, it was revealing very multi-layered and polyphonic landscapes, which are still related to the past of Latvia, but also in some in, in a very different ways, also. The to the present um, of that time and also the, the national context. And here you could show also the, second, the next slide. <laughs> so these are different uh, uh, photos from the, the project, which were part of the traveling portable land project. Um, so migration stories today of people working in culture and art, uh, both whether in peacetime or uh, water migration, uh, is that often they have the opportunity to continue working in cultural sphere that uh, in recent decades has been largely constructed to be internationally interconnected, and that's the main value of uh, contemporary culture and art world. Another essential layer talking about cultural migration uh, is related to the cultural geographical and also this cultural historical context. And um, Latvia, unlike Ukraine, is the small country. And therefore, uh, it is often perceived as a per peripheral or unknown, and literally still today, the migrators from the West are calling it a terra cognita, and the uh, Baltic region is often overlooked even by Eastern sco European scholarly uh, art world. And at the same time, it is also not much identifying anymore with the Soviet past and legacy. Uh, but Thinking what is common for our countries, it is definitely perspective that migration of cultural workers is a process that reduces or at least helps to reduce the ex exclusion and uh, marginalization that we still face. Uh, in our art scenes, um, in the international, you know, on one hand, it is bringing more active international exchange into the local environment, and it is also more actively introducing our art scenes internationally, developing regional connections. Maybe sometimes it's even more important. Also, active international circulations and collaborations on individual institutional level for artists, researchers, mm, and institutions. And uh, these migration issues, of course, are relevant both uh, at the individual level and the institutional level. And on the individual level, as one of the most important, uh, can emphasize education as. Mm, art students often go to study in the West, uh, and uh, which when now Latvia, which is part of the European Union, it is very easily uh, can be very easily done. And students, uh, or young people willing to study art, uh, especially often from the Netherlands, before it's also the UK, uh, and of course Nordic countries, where education in all fields is much uh, better, and consequently the starting capital of uh, these young people goes. If they return or if they stay, end up higher. Uh, and of course, it has impact on their international net networking for years. And uh, you can uh, 
again, if you can show the slides, a few examples of, um, yeah, the next slide, please. A yeah, um, few examples of uh, three artists, uh, uh, most of them are, like, two of them are living abroad, like Oliver Siljeva and um, Daiga Grantinja. And Eva Etner is is an artist who is living in in um, in, in Latvia and Riga, but uh, definitely through their art education, their international careers uh, have developed very successfully. And uh, here you could uh, uh, show the next slide, please. When talking about the institutional level, uh, I would also say that we benefit from uh, migration and internationalization of the art in many ways. And here put uh, three uh, bullet points uh, through more. So one is through more actively developed co cooperation projects. And here again in the slide, in the in, uh, left uh, uh, lower side, you can see this logo of project. The uh, title is from Com Complicated Past Shared Futures, uh, which is one of such examples um, uh, supported by Creative U Europe uh, program. Uh, that helps also to organize international exhibitions. For example, uh, today we are opening an exhibition at Malmo Art Museum, which is part of this uh, project of Shared Futures. Uh, yeah, at Malmo, uh, and it's a um, pro project that was uh, at the center of which is uh, a collection of Latin art from the late 30s. Uh, it's, it's curated by two curators. One of them is Inga Lati, who is um, is one of such migrating um, art workers who, um, and through this project we very, very um, literally see that it's not a lot, but it's a huge benefit that uh, our our previous colleagues continue to collaborate with us. Um, and also general de development of cultural and intellectual work, uh, critical thinking and international dialogue. And again, third uh, slide, you see it's, uh, it's also, part of the project website where we just uh, uh, brought out different uh, keywords, different themes which uh, are coming forefront through this project. And it's um, definitely uh, through, this, through this migrating context, it's also um, the development of uh, the discourse, for example, of terms like decoloniality, uh, the cold past, ecologies, feminism, gender, uh, solidarity, both socialism, uh, can be uh, brought to the uh, fore. Um, so the projects like this, they allow to strengthen also regional co collaborations and uh, develop more nuanced uh, views on discourses and contexts that are relevant for us. Uh, so here you maybe could come to the last slide. Uh, So yeah, uh, just a few conclusions um, uh, trying to sum up um, th this context uh, um, where basically <laughs> from uh, from this um, case studies that I can analyze, but I always see the migration of people, arts and cultural scenes today can be rather seen as a benefit, not a, like not a lot of problem or, or difficulty we should uh, hope this. Um, it uh, inevitably shows that uh, migration also relates to issues of identity and belonging in context of globalization, uh, where neither artists nor institutions are no longer tied to one place or, or how just fixed in, in, in one country. Uh, and this question of belonging is very fluid and changing, even though it's still, of course, very rele relevant. And also artists and creative practitioners are no longer tied to one place, but are kind of uh, in a flux between several places, absorbing the necessary contextual or cultural phenomena, and then combining them in resources uh, they need. Uh, so yeah, that was the, the experience I wanted to share with you. Uh, I will finish also here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yeva, for, for sharing um, this information with us. And um, 
Okay, the sound is on. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to the third. Uh, Yaba, please stay with us for the question and answer um, session. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder that we'll be waiting for you. And now I would like to give the floor to the third and last but not least presenter, uh, Giuntautas Mazeikis, if I'm sorry if I uh, mispronounced your name, uh, is a philosopher, cultural theorist, anthropologist, and professor at the um, Vitautas Magnum University in Kaunas, Lithuania, with the presentation Rebridging of Cultural Networks in Menzimorje. Um, the mic and the floor is yours. So, uh, I, I send uh, my, uh, pro probably you don't have my uh, presentation, no? Okay. Simon, could you resend? Could you resend the presentation? I have the text of the text, so you just want to just send it to me so you can see. Okay, 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 I will start. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Actually, I am, I asked one moment. Diana, when I asked him, I said that I'm a philosopher and working in the uh, field uh, of uh, critical theory. And uh, critical theory presupposes some dialectical approach. It means that uh, the, the system to show contradictions, you know, between social and economical or cultural contradictions on the different objects. And today I would like to speak as well on some, uh, some uh, issues. And I try to react on the, uh, uh, what's going on in this uh, conference because I, uh, had, have, I have had and have a good opportunity to listen to you and to participate. Thank you. And uh, uh, now I will, uh, I will start. And um, f first of all, I need to remark you that philosophers uh, work in with the concepts and metaphors and they use them uh, to open their reality. Critical theory which I follow opens ambiguity of reality, then uh, the contradictory processes in it. So uh, we use uh, ordinary not only um, language metaphors but as well pictures uh, as a metaphors and this is uh, why I would like uh, to show some, uh, some of them, but not as uh, artworks, but uh, first of all, as some, in the other condition, the metaphors. And first of all, um, uh, I, I'd like uh, to show, but you remember, uh, Antonovsky Bridge, uh, which in my opinion, uh, after destruction, I, all the history with Antonovsky Bridge in uh, Kherson, was a very nice uh, example, a metaphorical example, uh, uh, um, according uh, uh, which uh, we uh, uh, must build bridges that can be destroyed. You know, that's uh, to remember that uh, the success of cultural development directly depends on international inclusion and bridging activities a bridge is metaphor, cultural and economic exchange, dialogue and creativity between two separated banks among the gap or uh, the rapture uh, between, uh, uh, among uh, the people. And uh, ordinary when we are talking about uh, migration, even in Lithuania, I participated in a few of uh, projects we, where, which we call rebridging. Rebridging means uh, uh, to build a new form, new type of uh, bridges, which could, uh, which could, uh, uh, which could uh, uh, help us uh, to communicate. But at the beginning, we interpreted them in correct, in incorrect way, because we considered that uh, bridges is first of all means uh, returning, uh, returning, but uh, uh, bridges means returning. 
but uh, you know um, it's not uh, very correct because uh, b bridge uh, any bridge has many uh, of functions it's not uh, only about returning but as well about two side movements or sometimes uh, they need to be uh, to be uh, destroyed successful bridge uh, presupposes two side movement departing and returning all the time Bridge brings us strangers, and they can be friends, merchants, vagabonds, and enemies also. Antonovsky Bridge is the best example of such a variety, and its story can be used. It uh, was built too good, too strong, and was too important to be destroyed when Ukrainian military forces retreated from Kherson. When the nation which call itself other brother came with bloody war and many disasters. The metaphor tells us not to build too strong bridges even when you try to create the eternal brotherhood or imagined family. Uh, to destroy bridges means to send, in this our case, to send pro-Putinists out as well. The best in this sense is to build so-called drawbridges of the castles. You, you know that drawbridges is the bridges which could, you, which could be raised up and down. You know, that's uh, dependent from uh, political uh, situation or your friendship. However, there are bridges that, that do not connect banks, bridges that are dead ends bridges that, uh, that uh, are dead ends. The symbol of such, the symbol, uh, the symbol of such uh, is so-called uh, Plamburger Brücke, former symbol of Prussia, Prussia in Königsberg. Prussian leave the, uh, the land in order not to return more. The dead end of bridges or roads symbolizes an illusion of uh, cultural communication when nation create hermetic islands of traumas. In another way, I think that uh, to consider this uh, Palmburger Brutzke, this Palmburger uh, Bridge uh, uh, of Königsberg, I especially mentioned Königsberg, not Kaliningrad, it's a very good, I would say, example uh, of my uh, presentation, you know, that new nation which uh, came into empty lands uh, didn't uh, recognize the importance of this bridge, you know, and uh, this bridge uh, stayed until 2016, you know, uh, for a long time, as uh, some memorizing about that uh, former nations could not return and that bridges was breaked, that's dead end, and uh, even many of Germany's in, 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 uh, could, don't like to remember it as some kind of traumatic, uh, traumatic memory, and they prefer to just to, to forget, to, not, not just to forget, but to I would say uh, to to keep traumatic silence, to keep traumatic silence, to keep traumatic silence. Trauma could can be the deepest memory, and it need the hermetic consciousness. A hermetic consciousness means that there is no communication more about it. The end, the dead end means absence of communication, absence of exchange of ideas. That's, this is total, uh, some kind of uh, total end. I, I, I have the, the only other example, which is not uh, uh, about bridges. It's, uh, you know, a railroad to Auschwitz, which was as well called as dead, dead end, you know, dead end for many of people. But this bridge is as well some kind of uh, dead end. So uh, we need to separate from, uh, uh, from such kind of bridges, the so-called creative disjunctions. Uh, I think that 
the story of Königsberg were not learned and Ukrainian, for example, Luhansk, can has the same destiny if the title, for example, of Voroshilovo Grad will be returned back. So the next, uh, my slide, it's, uh, you know, that you see this uh, picture from, uh, from uh, Odessa. This, uh, you know, that Lenin transformed into a hero of Star Wars. That's, uh, uh, you know, that's excellent. I would say excellent situationist, international situationist work. Um, uh, and uh, it means that this is uh, uh, the work which uh, don't, uh, which doesn't union uh, us, but dissent or separate us. That's uh, the work which separate us from uh, Soviet uh, uh, nostalgia. The role of artist is ambiguous to provoke, to create diversity uh, in that one and the same time consent and dissent, union and rapture, to provoke and wonder. However, the state, for example, Ukraine, which fights for the freedom, needs unity, mobilization, sacrificing, condemnation of the enemies, and art pays big price by refusing its ambiguity and possibility to provoke, to create the others, and even strangers. I would say that the idea of unity, it's quite dangerous because one of the reason, uh, or one of the, I would say, aim, uh, uh, aim of that, according, for example, Emmanuel Levinas, is to create the others, it create the otherness, not to be similar, you know, uh, to confront, to create confrontation between each other. And when state in, and the state invites us to create, to, to, to build unity, to mobilize us, it works against, against uh, art nature, the, the nature of art. So, uh, a few words about uh, life and death, uh, life and death networking, or about monoculturalism. Yesterday and today, we spoke a lot about networking in a very positive sense. We always mentioned that it's like panacea uh, from all the uh, uh, diseases, you know, that it means like if we will create some network, you know, everything will be okay. Now I would like to speak as well about dead networking. Uh, from one side, networking uh, means active communication. From the other side, it can be used for providing of propaganda, making of hermetic communi communicative bubbles, or manufacturing of monocultures. The nations in the condition of emergency creates demands for monocultural development. Monoculturalism is the other phase of globalization or nationalization or one-dimensional society. Monocultural rhizom is dead culture. I mean toxic nationalist networks and authoritarian power or, or of oppressive systems. They copy each other, invite each other to share useful experience, but, not, but do not create open works of art in open uh, works of art. The living power of the rhizoma is a symbiotic relationship, a deeper dependence on each other. The example can be plantations of corn, uh, plantations of corn it's, uh, or grain or the other, um, you know, manufactured it, uh, manufactured it, uh, uh, plants uh, could be an uh, uh, example uh, of uh, not only monoculturalism, but as well so-called monocultural uh, deserts, monocultural deserts. Contrary, diversity means that, an that animals each e eat, animals eat each other. In Ecospheres, symbiotic uh, species destroy each other, and only in this way they create, they create 
eco, uh, they, they create ecosphere. You know, that's uh, forest, ponds, and tropic forests. Symbiotic eating each other in order, uh, uh, happens in order to develop common benefit and is a very difficult idea, but creative cultural diversity needs it. I think that you see that ordinary we speak about love and friendship. Now I'm speaking about needs to eat each other, you know, to destroy each other. Why? Because this is the only one way how rich ecosystems could survive. If we are friendly, we look like corn plantations, you know, one dimensional society with huge love inside, you know, or exactly uh, totalitarian terror. Totalitarian terror could be translated into love and humanism. That the most totalitarian countries means and thinks that they mean and think that they are the most human, humanistic, humanistic. This is so I'm talking about symbiotic eating each other, actually in metaphorical sense, not, not too much, not in the cannibalistic, but why maybe in this one possible. This is uh, why critical theory criticizes false humanism and peace rhetoric. For example, for example, Putin's propaganda seeks deliberation and calls that the, uh, the aim is stopping the war. Today, you know, Russian uh, broadcasts uh, speaks, repeat and repeat. They are looking for uh, deliberation, some diplomatic relationships with Ukraine. And they declare that we are for the peace, you know, and Ukraine for the war. You know, look, uh, and many of international uh, international uh, so communities, uh, institutions, and organizations, they just repeat this uh, Putinist rhetoric, we are for the peace. And what does mean this peace in this sense? Peace means oppression. You know, peace means uh, that you will be defeated, you know. Uh, peace means uh, uh, that uh, colonization, Peace means uh, uh, destruction of uh, freedom and identity. What is, this is the, 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 the peace. And the rhetoric of peace could be very falsified. Then uh, the another, uh, my uh, metaphor, uh, oh, it's uh, uh, actually there are many forms of uh, uh, um, uh, diversity in ecosystems, and one of the examples, it could be subcultural diversity, ordinary multiculturalism and uh, diversity of subcultures, diversity of subcultures represents the system, ecosystem, where metaphorically one uh, subculture eats the other subculture. And for them, it's normal because this is the only uh, principle of mutation and uh, development. Next, my example is about open waters. I tell a lot of times in Lithuania about importance of open waters. Open waters in the case of migration means that uh, people looks like m many of rivers, you know, many of rivers, and we uh, we flow in different, uh, in different countries, and uh, this is the only one case when uh, so-called, uh, when waters could be clean. In the other case, in the other case, if there is not open waters, and if there is no ecosystem where one species each eat, eat, sorry, eat uh, the other, we uh, could get so dead waters. Uh, dead waters means as well close waters. Uh, migration is normal condition of life of people, and only forcefully displaced persons are problem. So we have 
to separate exiled, displaced persons and migrants. Ordinary, we speak, uh, we mix all of them, that it looks like migrants and refugees and displaced persons are the same. Not at all. Displaced for purpose are forceful, forcefully uh, exiled, you know. And migrants, uh, that's a normal condition of nomadic people who travel from one uh, place uh, to, the, uh, to the other. And, we, and when we are talking about re rebuilding bridges, bridges, what do we mean? Are we speaking about migration, which that is normal condition for all people, you know, to migrate around the world? Or we are talking about returning of displaced persons, you know? This returning of displaced persons, that, uh, two colleagues from Latvia and Estonia, they mentioned about the Siberian Gulagian uh, situation. The, uh, we could call them as well displaced persons. You know, that's, uh, that's not because they are free migrants. Then uh, next, uh, my uh, metaphor, it's, uh, uh, oh, okay, this one I mentioned, this is about uh, monocultural, uh, uh, monoculturalism and uh, how this monoculturalism makes uh, so, so uh, agricultural deserts. Okay, and uh, the last my uh, example is uh, about the deter deteriorate Deterritorialization, you know, <laughs> deterritorialization. That's so always, you know, it's a problem to pronounce this uh, word. Uh, this uh, topic of deterritorialization, it was very popular uh, between uh, postmodern uh, 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 thinkers and artists. It means that uh, we create a global condition. We don't need to be in one space, you know, one, ti one time. We are different and we are nomads, this is normal. However, uh, there is the other possibility for the same concept uh, that some uh, states would like to clean territories, you know. And this cleaning of territories from one group of people, at, uh, you know, uh, or genocide, from one group of people means as well deterritorialization, you know. So we see in this case as well ambiguous concept, ambiguity of concept and contradiction of this concept, which as well, uh, which could be and should be, uh, should be, uh, you know, uh, considered. I am sure that uh, some deterritorialization happens in Ukraine now. You know, and uh, in future it will be uh, there are a lot of problems how to recreate, you know, echo niches of uh, many of people. One time, uh, the last my example, you know, from 2000, uh, and from the uh, uh, this yeah, from 2000, many of Lithuanians, as uh, everywhere in Baltic countries or in Poland, migrated, you know, abroad. Then we, but it was free migration, normal uh, migration. We invited, uh, invited them back. And one uh, mayor of city asked me uh, that so many creative people leave the city and they traveled around the world and don't like to return back. And he asked me uh, what uh, I could uh, propose, uh, suggest uh, to him. And my suggestion was you need to buy Bohemia, Bohemia, uh, artist Bo Bohemia. Uh, he asked uh, this dr uh, drink and drug uh, uh, artist, should I uh, 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 buy and to invite uh, to the city? Yes, I said, you should uh, 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 buy, uh, you know, uh, free sexual, uh, free di different races, uh, Bohemia, which uses probably drugs, and uh, they behave in an incorrect way, but only this opening will return back creative people, you know. If you would like to build city of just labor workers, you know, with cheap labor forces, okay, you could do it, you know, but it's not about returning 
of uh, creative uh, people. If you, you would like to return them back, you have to rethink your ethics or your ethical approach to artists. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gintautas, for the presentation. We have very different approaches to, uh, to the question of uh, migration. Um, and, okay, I'm happy that we have Yara, Yava and Karen here with us. Um, I, I suggest we start with questions, if you have any, to our presenters, and then we can also have a few minutes for general session of questions, reflections, and comments on today's of the conference. So if any, anyone has the question, please raise your hand and we will give you the microphone for the speakers to hear. Okay, we have from Irina Starovoit. Um, I can pass the mic to you, just a second. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question and a comment for the last presenter, and I hope it will um, help and uh, clear up things for the previous presenters as well. You have been thinking in parallel to natural history and to ecology, and you have been coining this very important term of the previous epoch, of the epoch of postmodernism, which is the other. But um, my impression is that you mixed up the concept of the other with the concept of enemy. And in my understanding of reading all the books which were devoted to the topic, the other is not necessarily the enemy. More than that, the other is not necessarily the radical other. There is a spectrum of, of otherness. We can start with close other. We can start from neighbor then stranger, then guest, and so on and so forth, we also can think about being the other to ourselves. And uh, in that respect, you have been trying to impose, at least I understand that, on Ukraine, the threat of monoculturalism. But what I see in Ukraine now we just, on the contrary, during this war, which started not on the February 22, but uh, on the be beginning of the year 2014, actually, we are rediscovering and reinventing the, the diversity and complexity of Ukrainian society itself. We are dis rediscovering the Jewish heritage of Ukraine, the Crimean Tatars living heritage of Ukraine, the Greeks of Mariupol, and many others. But these also are subcultural communities. These also are different age groups, which in many respects are the other to each other. <laughs> but they are now collaborate and they unite under the threat, but it doesn't make them the same. This is the experience of common threat and common resistance. But right, um, just imagine that we um, come to the point of safety network again, and this diversity will flourish again. We are like big Italian family. We quarrel all the time. We only stop when there is this bigger threat um, before us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Nice uh, comment. I accept uh, everything. Yeah, but uh, you know that's uh, what you say. Uh, okay, I don't see that. Uh, um, uh, very big uh, contradictions because I didn't mention that the other is enemy, uh, but I accept that uh, that otherness could be very different, which you uh, try to classify it. You know, uh, okay, uh, that uh, they are co could be very different. The second that otherness presupposes ethical attitude to each other. It's not only about it's not about political. Political means uh, a little bit uh, different. It's about uh, uh, competition, it's about uh, conflict, it's about uh, deliberation, it's less about ethical issues. 
so, um, in any way, uh, in any way, I am not sure that the war is the best condition for the development of uh, diversity. But it's not uh, the guilty of Ukraine. You know, we everybody knows uh, knows about it. Uh, however, uh, in any case, uh, that uh, uh, provocation uh, is uh, which uh, could create so-called creative rupture. I'm, uh, this, I took this uh, concept of creative, creative rupture from um, European Commission uh, uh, so-called Green Book, you know, uh, which uh, uh, recommended for EU countries uh, to develop uh, the uh, art, uh, which uh, it will be not oriented uh, the only about uh, mm -hmm. uh, sustainable development, but as well about uh, uh, creative ruptures, I mean, uh, creative uh, diversities, which uh, doesn't guarantee, uh, 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 doesn't guarantee uh, that common uh, uh, common understanding that this is normal. Uh, it's normal not to understand each other. You know, uh, should be. I w one time I remember George Soros came uh, to Lithuania one uh, postmodern exhibition, and uh, when he looked, he financed uh, this exhibition. And when he looked, he uh, back uh, to microphone and start to speak very strange uh, language and no one translator could translate him. Later he asked translators, uh, did you understand me? Everybody said, we don't know what, which language uh, do you speak? And he answered, I, I didn't understand this exhibition as well. You, s you see, but it, it was uh, his, uh, but he financed all this exhibition in, and accepted it means that we could accept uh, those the things which could uh, not uh, which we could not understand what's happened in, in the situation of uh, consent when we're looking for consent even uh, if this consent about uh, so called uh, 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 or benefit of society or you know that good visions of society the consent, in a way, uh, means uh, that uh, we lost the uh, possibility of dissent. And my uh, presentation was uh, not, uh, not I, 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 make my I made my presentation not to criticize uh, um, artist uh, situation in Ukraine, uh, but uh, rather uh, it was reaction on uh, attempts uh, to, to find consent between artists. You know, on my uh, opinion, consent between artists uh, could be toxic. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran Tautas, for this comment. Uh, and uh, before I pass the mic to the audience, I have um, a question to um, all of the presenters. Um, uh, I, I would like to ask you for, for to share from your observations and your experience. Uh, how do because we are talking a lot about people being relocated, about different kinds of migrations and uh, the ways how we can stay connected, nevertheless. Um, and it is very valuable, uh, but how do we stay integrated in the local cultural field? Because when you are away, it is difficult to understand all the uh, details of what is happening in, uh, in your country, in, your, in the culture of your country. And um, maybe you have uh, some um, observations of how can we stay integrated in, in this general cultural field of, of the country. Um, maybe someone from our online um, participants would like to, to share. Okay. 
Maybe try to comment on it. Okay, an answer. Um, but I think it's really important, and, and also when I was thinking about it, but it's what are important layers about the migration uh, as speaking in the Latin context. Um, I think it is this um, thing's connection, uh, definitely international connection, is, which is uh, much more fruitful than uh, saying just just staying in, in locality. But uh, the same thing is, um, it is not losing uh, um, understanding of, of the locality. And I think especially, especially for the current global context, it um, it is showing that it is possible to stay in a field very nuanced in understanding about the localities. And actually, I like this this concept of trans locality. Uh, at the same time, being uh, international, being connected to different localities, and it doesn't necessarily mean losing the nuances or nuanced, multi-layered understandings of. Um, Maybe the context you are, you uh, the person has been coming from, and um, at that point finding himself or himself global, you know, uh, maybe yeah, very general. So some, some. Thank you, thank you. And uh, if uh, um, the sound in the uh, audience is not as good as it is uh, online, so if. Uh, uh, you're experiencing difficulties, you can take the headphones because the translation works better um, uh, if there is uh, some difficulties with the sound. Uh, I don't know, Yeva, maybe you... Um, oh, I'm sorry, Karen, maybe you have uh, anything to add? Yes, I'm, I'm very sorry. I thought that it's, it might be a problem of my computer, but um, Eva's talk has a very uh, strong echo, so I couldn't really catch everything that you were, you were saying, but... Uh, but if I caught the right idea, I think it's very much something that I would also like to reflect that I think, I don't know if it has something to do with a small nation, big nation controversy, but I think in general, the contemporary art world and the contemporary culture field in general is very uh, international, at least in Estonia, it is uh, anyways a, a way of um, doing things here. So I think as per se, the culture life is already very international and, and taking part of different uh, international um, exhibitions or symposiums is, is part of the uh, um, uh, part of the, the art life and cultural life in general, then uh, this is not, I, I don't think it's necessarily an issue that if you are a migrant or a global citizen, that it's very difficult to stay connected with something that is going on in Estonia. But at the same time, I do believe that um, new societies, new environments, no, uh, new um, um, locations tend to swallow people. So it is an emphasis, sort of, to stay connected. It, it, it needs uh, dedication to stay connected because I think especially uh, what our experience in the Estonian museum sector is that when people migrate and move away, they they need to take effort to stay connected with the cultural uh, field and the, and the institutional level in Estonia, because it's it's just very humane that the new location tends to swallow it very quickly. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Gion Dautas, do you have anything to add? Uh, okay, that's I, I would like to add to the previous uh, uh, question and your question. The previous question, in my opinion, was wonderful. And uh, that's I remember about uh, that uh, situation that this internalization or international uh, communities of artists uh, in Baltic countries means a little bit uh, different uh, probably than in Ukraine because what I found interesting for me in Ukraine is uh, that you are talking about decolonization. Decolonization, in my opinion, is a very, very important uh, topic. Decolonization presupposes as well some kind of uh, uh, dissent uh, between those who support, for example, Mikhail Bulgakov and those who criticize him, or between them who uh, try to uh, understand uh, uh, Yossi Brodsky and those who criticize him. 
and uh, there are many of such uh, cases, you know. And I think that the both uh, situation there is you, uh, could be useful, uh, you know. So the, the debates, uh, debates uh, could be only in the case if we interpret uh, it uh, differently. Why it's uh, in Lithuania? Uh, it's not very relevant for Lithuania because uh, Lithuania, okay, because le this language differences, probably in Estonia the same, uh, Latvia the same, language differences between Russian and uh, uh, Lithuania that uh, many, okay, Russians uh, never were uh, very interested in so small uh, a nation, you know, and didn't uh, write, uh, you know, uh, some verses against Lithuanian independence. And, uh, you know, in this case, uh, when we're talking about uh, decolonization in Lithuania, we are doing it. So this quite empty uh, uh, topic uh, without uh, deep uh, content. Uh, there is no what to discuss too much about, uh, you know, decolonization because that there are very rare cases of colonization. That's uh, two uh, cultures were not mixed, you know. And I think that the decolonization in a uh, Ukrainian case is painful, but uh, it should be, on my case, to, on my viewpoint, completely disaster in a Belarusian uh, situation, when they will start to speak about uh, decolonization. Uh, when uh, decolonization uh, means uh, mm, some suicide, that's... Uh, it's not, uh, for me, it's not uh, clear because, you know, uh, uh, some, the, some symbiotic, uh, uh, some, uh, symbi some symbiotic uh, relationships could be so intensive that you, when you break this uh, symbiotic relationships, it's not clear how culture could uh, successfully survive, I would say. And thank uh, thank you. you. Um, I think that we, we are lack of time, and um, I agree that decolonization issues are very important. But we will need additional three days to to talk about this, and uh, let's not shift away from from the uh, topic of um, uh, our discussion today. Uh, if anyone uh, here has a question or a comment, uh, we can pass the mic. Just. Okay, we have we have a question from Aleftina. A comment. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, I will make a comment about decolonization. Actually, since Ukrainians started to travel more because of the war, and I was in Estonia, and what I noticed that decolonization also have to happen with uh, citizen of Estonia, citizen of Lithuania and Latvia who do speak Russian, because. Um, they looks like, like in your speech, others. And I was, for instance, in uh, one museum, doesn't matter, I just will not tell the title of the exhibition, it's not so much important. The interesting thing I noticed, there was the audio guide, which was in Estonian, and it was in Russian. And two versions of those were different. And I suppose, that the curator, who is Estonian-speaking person, even haven't checked. And I was almost screaming when I noticed this difference. And be honest, when I was in Tallinn, I was uh, looking on the situation there, and my very clear understanding of the colonization for the people who do live in Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, who do speak Russian till now. And it's so hard even just to take taxi without hearing Russian sentence. Kuda uh, Thank you, Aleftina. I don't know, maybe Karen has something to add. Uh, uh, I, uh, from the feedback from Artistic Society, I also heard that it's um, pretty typical for for Estonian uh, media as well to have this different information uh, in Estonian and in Russian. Uh, for example, but uh, maybe you could give a bit of more context uh, to, to what Aleftina had been saying. Um, yes, it was I in think it's, it's partly too, true. It's uh, part of the way um, 
messages are delivered. And I think that uh, in some areas, people are also super cautious and uh, aware how to, what kind of a vocabulary or what kind of um, ways of messaging to use, whether you do it in Estonian or you do it in, in Russian. Um, if the reference was towards the audio guide at, at Babamo, then uh, as much as I have heard, they actually consciously made the decision to use some topics and some sentences differently in Estonian and in Russian uh, while creating and curating the exhibition and the and the audio guide, uh, just to to make uh, some of the um, ideas and points more clear or more uh, in adjustments to the audience that might be listening to it. So yes, I think this criticism is very relevant that uh, we have been using this in Estonian society. We're still using this, that we we tend to approach uh, these audiences is differently and message them differently. Um, thank you. Um, I agree that we have the decolonization is a process and that is what's happening in um, um, probably all countries that share this post-imperial heritage after the Russian Empire and Soviet Union. And we have a lot of work to do, but as I said, we'll need three more days for for this topic to share. If uh, we have more questions, we have time for just one question or comment. Um, I just uh, say, it was not in your museum, it was in Narva, but in Russian audio guide was no word queer. But in Estonian version of audio guide was word queer. This is what's the difference. And I don't think this is the relevant to actually make the messages to, to audience, because um, I would say the uh, value to let people to identify themselves as queer must to be relevant to Russian-speaking people in Estonia and um, Estonian-speaking people in Estonia. I think we can all agree on that. Um, looks like we don't have any additional questions. Then I will thank uh, all of the participants for your presentations. Thank you. The experience you shared is, is truly um, valuable for us. And um, as I said, we'll be working with analytics on these uh, presentations. So hopefully this will come to uh, a set of recommendations and we will use this international experience in terms of um, working, continually working uh, with a migration problem uh, in Ukraine and abroad. Um, so thank you all for, for sharing your uh, experience and um, it was a pleasure to have you at least online with us, um, but you have to stay connected in various uh, ways. Um, and by this, I would like to end today's conversations. Uh, we'll be having uh, dinner in 15 minutes at the same uh, place, and we can share our um, um, our observations there. So thank thank you, everyone. Thank you.